Great. We, you know, we all know the greatest unsolved problem in computer science is connecting laptops to projectors. Someday this problem will eventually be solved, but apparently not. it's not done yet. Uh, I just need a second to see if I can figure out how to manipulate this different PowerPoint presenter here. I'm just trying to figure out how to point on the screen. That doesn't seem to be working. Jamal, I don't suppose you know how to uh, use the mouse as a pointer if I want to point on the screen. In regular PowerPoint, it'd be control click. Um, let's hide that first. Is it, uh, I think, I thought there was a next. Yeah, maybe that. No, I can do or, that. Or, no, but or, I, or the key. No, no, but I want to actually be able to, you know, point to things on the screen and have that appear up there. Okay, so we. Is there any way to do that? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have to use the mouse. And then, or if you point here, yeah, I don't know. Mouse is on. Yeah, you can see it's it. Full screen, right? Just get the mouse. <laughs> Yeah, but oh, then he, has, the to mouse back and he forth. has to look there. I see. Yeah, sorry. All right. Well. <laughs> so the mouse is over here. Nope. Which you, way? Which screen is it? This way? Yeah, that's a bit. Uh, huh. You see it? It's uh, okay, be I'll, I'll live without it. That's fine. All right. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to speak. And sorry for all the, the slide goof ups. So this morning, what I'd like to do is give you at least my personal take on what I think the future of data center networking should be. And it's, it, to achieve my, what I, where I think we should be is going to require some fairly significant changes. So first, I think it's important to recognize that we have amazing data center networking hardware today. The hardware people have really done an awesome job. You know, link speeds are rising at a tremendous rate, we're at 100 gigabits per second and running up from there. The round trip times that you can achieve in hardware are down in the five, maybe 10 microsecond range and may go lower over the next few years. And these amazing switching chips have been developed you know, that allow us to have this performance at a relatively low cost per port. So it's just amazing hardware. The problem is that only a bit of that raw hardware potential is actually getting through to applications today. And in particular, the kind of performance we'd like to get for small messages, latency and throughput, you just can't, we can't achieve anywhere near what the networking hardware can provide. I mean, we're one to two orders of magnitude off or more. And the problem is it's the overheads in the software network stacks. So if we want to make this hardware potential available to applications, we're going to need to make some pretty radical changes. And I'm going to talk about three of them today. First and foremost, we have to find a way to get past TCP and introduce a new transport protocol. And I'm not going to argue that's easy, but, but there is really no other way, I'm going to argue, if we want to allow that hard potential to get through. So I'll probably spend most of the talk talking about that. But then there are two other things in addition. We're going to need better RPC frameworks than we have today. And then ultimately, we're gonna to have to move transport out of software. It just it really doesn't make sense to try and implement transport protocols in software for today's amazing networking. And so that's gonna involve moving to the NICs, which I think is also gonna require a pretty radical new NIC architecture in order to do that. So over the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'm, I'll try and talk through all of those things. I'll spend most of my time on the TCP issue. So first, what would we like to get out of the network? Well, I'm going to focus mostly on performance. There are clearly other things besides just performance, but, but for today, I'm going to focus on performance. And there's three things you'd like to get. First, we'd like to get what I call data throughput. That is, when you're sending very large objects, we'd like to be able to transmit them at full link speed. Well, this has always been TCP's sweet spot. It's been the area people have optimized for decades. And actually, you know, we do pretty well on this in today's data center networks. But the other two, not so well. So the next thing is, for small messages, we'd like to have very low latency. In fact, we'd like to have low tail latency in 99th or 99.9th percentile. And in principle, we should be able to do that. We should be able to get under 10 microseconds tail latency for short messages round trip in the network, including you know, all the application over full end to end. We should be able to do 10 microseconds round trip 99th percentile latency. We're about two orders of magnitude off from that. You know, TCP is up in the millisecond range for that today. 
And then the third thing is, and this one, actually, I haven't really heard this one talked about very much, but message throughput is also important. That is, when you're sending short messages, at what rate can you transmit large numbers of short messages? And this is important for large-scale data center applications that are, that are working closely together for doing various kinds of group communication operations, such as broadcast or shuffle or all gather, where you typically need to send out large numbers of messages. And the networking makes it possible to do, I don't know, it's sort of the, the tens to maybe 100 million short messages per second. Today, in software, if you can do 1 million messages per second, you're kind of pushing the limits of what's possible. So we're just way off. And then again, just to remind everybody, it's, it's we want to get this performance up to the applications. That's the key. How do we allow you know, software, interesting programs to achieve this kind of performance? So in order to do this, then those requirements actually imply a few other requirements that I'll also talk about today. The first thing is we have to do load balancing across cores. It simply isn't possible to handle network speeds of much above 10 gigabits per second and do it all in one core. You know, what's interesting is that at 10 gigs, you could kind of handle full network speed in one core. And I think people in the network community, we convinced ourselves we can do this all in software. But 10 gigs was the absolute top. You really just, you just can't do it. So you have to figure out a way to spread the work across multiple cores. The problem with that is it's really, really hard to do that load balancing evenly. And you end up with hot spots. And those hot spots limit the throughput. And they also drive up the tail latency. And I'll give some examples later on in the talk. And uh, by the way, ultimately, I'm going to argue that this problem is so severe, this is the reason why we have to move transports to, to NIC hardware. But if we're going to keep them in software, we have to do load balancing. Then the second set of implied requirements has to do with congestion control. You know, we have to manage the buildup of buffers in the various switches of the network and the queuing that happens, for, particularly for short messages. And congestion can happen in two places. It can happen in the network core fabric or it can happen at the edge. In the core fabric, I'm going to argue that, in fact, congestion is avoidable if we do load balancing correctly. Unfortunately, we don't today. In particular, TCP cannot do load balancing correctly. And so that impacts throughput and also creates latency issues. Congestion at the edge, that is, at the downlink to a, an ed, end host, that's unavoidable because fundamentally, if you have two senders sending to the same destination, they can transmit faster than you can possibly send bits down over the downlink. So you can't avoid some degree of congestion at the edge, but, but we need to be able to manage that. And again, if we don't manage it, then buffer buildup there increases latency. So these aren't sort of the end goals, but in order to achieve our end goals, we're going to have to solve these two problems as well. So let me start off with first part of the talk, and this, is, this will probably take most of the talk, is replacing TCP. So first of all, kudos to TCP. I mean, it's an amazing protocol to think about this protocol was designed 40 years ago at a time when there were I think less than 100 total hosts in the internet and fast link speeds were measured in tens of kilobits per second and you extrapolate forward today with you know billions of machines and link speeds and the sort of approaching the terabit range it's really amazing that TCP has survived as long as it has and actually today even today I think it works pretty well in the wide area but there were no data centers when TCP was designed. So unsurprisingly, it was not designed for data centers. And I'm going to argue that every single aspect, every major aspect of TCP's design is wrong for the data center. There was, there was literally, I'm not able to identify anything about TCP that is right for the data center. If you have ideas at the end of the talk, I'd be happy to hear them. And I'm going to go through each of these five things over the next set of slides to talk about them. So in fact, what we need to do, if we really want to have a protocol that works well in the data centers, we have to change all five of those. And to do that, we're going to have to replace TCP. Or, you know, not, we're not going to entirely replace it, but basically displace it for most data center applications. And I'm going to argue that the HOMA protocol is actually a pretty good choice for that. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about HOMA and how HOMA does the things in blue that you see on the right side of the slide there. And then I'll also argue that um, so replacing TCP ain't going to be easy, but it might be possible by leveraging RPC frameworks. That is by introducing support for HOMA or some other protocol in RPC frameworks that could allow us to reach a large number of applications without requiring very many application changes. So this is a quick outline of what I'm going to do in the next dozen slides or so. Okay, so I just want to go through now five key features of TCP. 
each one of them wrong for the data center. So let's start with basics, the TCP data model, which is a byte stream. So that means, for example, if a sender wants to send a bunch of messages to a particular receiver, those messages get serialized in a stream of bytes that go out over the network in TCP. And then on the other side, by the time the data gets to the other side, although I've shown the messages here with different colors and boundaries between them, of course, there is no such thing in the stream. They're just bytes. There's no obvious divisions between messages. And so when the receiver receives that, typically, you know, they use a fixed size buffer and pull data off the wire and blocks. And so there's no guarantee that what you get on the other side bears any resemblance to the messages that were pumped in on the sender side. You know, you could have, it could require multiple blocks to read one message or a single block of data that comes in could contain bits and pieces from several different messages. So this is a problem because applications really care about messages. They don't care about, in general, they don't care about bytes. They want to know about message boundaries, but TCP doesn't preserve those. So the first problem is if you care about messages, then you have to introduce, of course, your own message mechanism, like adding lengths, prepending the length of each message before the message. And then when you receive it, you have to piece the messages back together again by, for example, breaking up one block into multiple messages or combining multiple blocks together into one message. Now, this is a little bit annoying, but it's not, this isn't a showstopper by itself. But what is a showstopper is you can't do load balancing with this mechanism. It's really catastrophic for load balancing. But suppose you have one stream and you'd like to have several threads cooperating to handle that because you want to handle a lot of traffic. Well, the problem is if those threads read from the stream, there's no guarantee that a thread is going to get a whole message to read. And what threads, of course, need, they need these dispatchable units, messages. And so, for example, that green message, you know, the blocks are spread across, pieces of the message are spread across three different threads. Maybe in principle, the threads could coordinate with each other, maybe to reassemble those messages, but that would be so expensive, probably it doesn't, doesn't make sense to do. So you really can't do uh, load balancing with this mechanism. And by the way, if we should have some future world where the NIC is dispatching directly to user threads, bypassing the kernel, the NIC can't do that either. What you have to do instead is one of two things. First choice is you introduce a dispatcher thread. So if you have a collection of connections coming in over the network, the dispatcher thread reads from all of those connections, reassembles messages appropriately, and then dispatches those messages out to some collection of worker threads that can then handle them in parallel. This is what we used, by the way, in the RAM Cloud project. Uh, so this allows you to do good load balancing but the problem is you now have this extra thread in the process. And so that's a considerable amount of extra latency to pass messages first through one thread and then off to another thread. And furthermore, the dispatcher instantly becomes a performance bottleneck. And uh, the data I've seen so far suggests you can do maybe a million messages a second, roughly with the scheme, maybe a little bit more than that, but that's way less than what modern networks can handle. So it's really, really not a very good approach. The second approach, is that you partition the connections. So divide them up, assign a few connections statically to each of the worker threads, and then that worker thread will have exclusive ownership of that connection. So then it can receive the bits and pieces of messages and reassemble them and process them and so on. Uh, the problem with this is it's a really bad approach to load balancing because it's static. And so it's highly unlikely you're gonna be able to predict the loading across those connections in order to balance your load evenly. You're gonna get hot spots, and that's gonna be a performance problem. And by the way, you're going to end up with a lot of these threads underutilized while other threads are hot spots that are making your performance really bad. So there really, I, there really isn't a great solution, unfortunately, because of that. Okay, let's go back to byte stream, but we're not done with the problems yet. Next problem is the byte streams are susceptible to head of line blocking. So if you send a series of messages to the same target, they're going to go in the same stream. And one small message could get stuck behind a couple of really long messages. And so it can't get through until the long messages have been transmitted. And that's a really high source of tail latency. In fact, again, in the RAM Cloud project, we noticed this was one of the main factors of tail latency, was head of line blocking like this. Where in this case, what happened is a server had to send short replication messages to other servers, which were on the critical path of doing write operations. But then there were these large messages for log cleaning, garbage collection, that could also interfere with them and cause head of line blocking. 
So that's a problem. And then finally, with streams, the reliability mechanism that streams provide is really not the one that applications want. You know, what an application wants typically is a round trip guarantee. That is, as a client, you want to know that your request is going to be delivered to the server. You want to know the server is going to process it and you want to get a response back. And if any of those things fails, you want to get some sort of error indication back again. The problem is that streams don't do that. They only do part of the job. So a stream will make a best effort attempt to deliver either a request or a response, but those are effectively independent streams. And there's, you get no notification back if, for example, the server doesn't process your request. Or if, in fact, with TCP streams, you often, depending on how you've configured it, you often get no notification back if the other side crashes completely. So what that means is that if you want to use TCP, you end up having to build your own additional timeout mechanisms at application level because what TCP provides is not adequate. So it's sort of silly because TCP does implement timers. They're just not the right timers that applications want. All right, so that's the, the first issue, which is TCP streaming. Next issue, TCP is connection oriented. In fact, I think it's a sort of an article of faith in the networking world that of course you must have connections if you want interesting properties like flow control and congestion control and um, you know recovery from lost packets and so on. So TCP requires state that lives for the entire life of the stream. In Linux, it's pretty expensive. It's about 2,000 bytes per socket for Linux, and that's not even including the packet buffers. That's just the, the, you know, the SOC SK buff structure. And one problem with this is that applications in data centers tend to have lots of connections open. They can have thousands of connections open. Servers can have tens of thousands of incoming connections. And so first, just the state buildup is enough to be problematic. For example, at Facebook, they decided they couldn't handle that, and so they introduced a proxy mechanism on clients to try and coalesce connections to servers in order to cut down the number of connections servers have. That added a whole bunch of overhead, kind of analogous to the dispatching thread I just talked about. And also, this is a problem with NIC offloading. You know, certainly in the InfiniBand NICs, like for example, Mellanox's NICs for RDMA, you know, for many years it was a problem that the cache on the NIC of, of connections was relatively small, in the order of a few tens of connections. And if you had more connections open than that, then that cache would thrash with the NIC constantly having to refresh its connection state from main memory, and you get really poor performance. So having large numbers of connections is uh, it's just really challenging from an implementation standpoint, particularly if we want to start offloading things to the NIC. And another problem with connections is that it means you have to pay an extra round trip at the beginning to create the connect to establish the connection. Now, traditionally, this hasn't really been a problem because you keep a connection open for a long time, and so you can amortize that round trip over a lot of operations. But we're seeing in the data center more and more of these you know, microservices or serverless environments where the, the applications live for very short periods of time, you know, less than a second, maybe even if only a few tens of milliseconds. And so in that kind of an environment, the overhead for, for that connection setup can be really high. You don't, you don't have enough traffic to amortize that, particularly if you, again, have a lot of servers you want to talk to in a very short-lived uh, service. So the round trip time is also a problem. As I said, the motivation for this is because historically, people, I think, have generally believed you have to have them in order to get these really nice features. But it turns out you don't need connections to get all of those features. And I'll show you how, for example, HOMA does not have connections, but provides all of those same features. Third thing about TCP is that it's based on fair scheduling. That is, when the traffic into or out of a machine is more than the link can sustain, it tries to roughly balance, its, share its bandwidth across the connections that would like to use that bandwidth. So for example, uh, if, a, if a whole bunch of long flows are coming into a machine, it might try and roughly interleave the packets from those flows. Now the problem with that is that that means all of the flows complete slowly. It's well known that fair scheduling is a bad algorithm in terms of minimizing response time. In fact, the more fairly you schedule it, the more closely all of the flows finish at the very, very end. So what we'd like to do instead is use some kind of run to completion approach. Pick some flow and finish it. There's no benefit. You provide no benefit to doing most of a flow. The only benefit comes when the flow is complete. 
And so run to completion is clearly better and better best yet if you can do SRPT, shortest remaining processing time first. As those are known, that's provably optimal in terms of minimizing average completion time. And you can see this particular example, two out of those three flows finish strictly faster and the third one finishes just as fast as it would have in the, uh, in the fair scheduling mechanism. Now, the problem with this is that you can't do this if you don't know the lengths of the messages. So unfortunately, in TCP's world, I think fair scheduling is about the best it can do because it has no idea how much it has to receive in order to be done with the particular flow. And by the way, it's interesting to point out that we call it fair scheduling, but it isn't actually fair. So this graph shows some performance measurements I did on Linux. And it's got TCP is in the, the green curve and DC TCP is the brown curve. This is running a particular workload based on data center traces. It's a representative data center application running at a fairly high network load, 80% network load. And the x-axis shows the length of messages from smallest on the left to largest on the right. And then the y-axis shows slowdown. And slowdown is measured as the time it takes for a message of this size running under load at 80% load. Divide that by the best possible time for messages of this size on an unloaded network. So you can think of it as how much worse things run when the network is running at load. And this is showing P99 or 99th percentile latency. So if, uh, first of all, you can see the numbers are really high for TCP, more than a 100x slowdown for short messages running at load. But what's interesting is that long messages do much better. It's almost an order of magnitude difference in slowdown between short messages and long messages. So the, I think one of the moral of the story is that when short messages and long messages compete on what's called you think this fair footing, the short messages really get screwed. The long messages just do much better. So bottom line is TCP isn't really even fair. DC TCP by was clearly better, but even there, there's a pretty big gap, maybe a factor of five or six in, in slowdown between the short messages and the long messages. Okay, let's move on to point four of the five. Congestion control. In TCP, of course, congestion control is driven from the senders. So they're expected to somehow figure out when there is buffer buildup occurring in the network and then scale back their transmission rates in order to avoid excessive buffer buildup. But of course, senders have no direct information about congestion. And so they depend on getting it from someplace else and the way that happens in TCP, of course, is it's done through buffer occupancy. Buffer occupancy is the only congestion signal available in TCP. And of course, in the most extreme case, uh, if, a if a buffer completely fills up, the queue overflows and packets get dropped, then there's a timeout. That's the extreme case. But that's catastrophic enough that, of course, we try very, very hard to make sure that almost never happens. And so nowadays, there are various kinds of early congestion notifications, and, and lots of papers have been written about how to make those smarter and do various kinds of things, where information gets sent back to senders as queues start to build, and then the sender uses that information to scale back its transmission rates. So this has a couple of, of problems. The first one is it means fundamentally there's no way to detect congestion without buffer buildup. Can't happen. And as soon as you have buffer buildup, that causes delays. So you're pretty much guaranteed to have non-trivial amounts of buffer buildup when the system's running at load. And, and that's going to cause delays, particularly because TCP has only a, basically a single class of service. That is, all messages, all flows of all size use the same queues. So buffer buildup that's caused, that it's caused by, say, a long message is also going to impact short messages going to the same destination. So that's problematic. And then finally, the fifth aspect of TCP's design is that it assumes that packets are delivered in the same order that they were transmitted. And if they're not, if they arrive out of order, that's assumed to indicate that a packet drop occurred. So it's, it, that's a fairly, uh, a fairly non-trivial penalty when that happens. This unfortunately does really bad things to load balancing. And it hurts both in the network hardware and in software. I'll show you examples of each. And is one of the primary causes of tail latency. So first, let's talk about the, in the networking hardware. This rule means you have to use flow consistent routing in the network. You can't use packet spring in a network fabric. 
And so once you've picked a path for the first, first packet of a flow, every future packet in that flow has to follow the same path to make sure that there's no reordering. And of course, the problem is that each flow picks its path independently, typically some random hashing function. And so if some other flow happens to hash to the same intermediate link in the network fabric, then ne neither of those flows can transmit at full bandwidth. Fundamentally, uh, they're going to have to share that bandwidth, and queues will build up at that link. And those queues, of course, will affect not just those flows, but any other flows that also happen to hash through those links. And what's unfortunate about this is this will happen even if the overall fabric load is really low. I mean, it's just, it's just a random probability, but even if the, there's almost no traffic on the fabric, there are still gonna be cases where two flows happen to hash to the same link, and then you're gonna get congestion. So it's, it's unavoidable. I, I would love to see measurements on this, but I hypothesize that virtually all core fabric congestion in modern data centers is because of flow consistent routing in TCP. Uh, I haven't seen any measurements of that. I'd, any of you have, have access to data centers where you could measure that? It'd be a really great service if you could measure that and tell us is that true. So anyhow, it's a, it's a serious problem in terms of the network hardware. It's also a problem in terms of software because it means that packets have to traverse the same set of cores as they work their way through a processor. And of course in Linux, in the, in the typical case, an incoming packet will traverse three cores. First, the NIC will deliver that packet to a, a driver core, the NAPI layer, uh, and then the packet next gets passed off to the soft IRQ layer or the network stack layer. And then finally, the data ends up off in an application. And typically, these are all in different cores. So the problem is that in order to preserve packet ordering, the same set of cores have to be used for all packets in a flow. And you know, if two different flows happen to hash to, say, the same soft IRQ core, then you get hotspots that cause high tail latency and uneven loading. And I've measured this. This is the dominant source of software-induced tail latency for TCP, and actually you're going to see for HOMA as well inside Linux. So that's problematic. OK, so five things. All of them TCP is wrong. The question is, can't we just repair TCP? I, I don't think so. There's too many problems. They're really fundamental problems, like the basic data model is wrong, for example. And they're tied together. The fact that no message boundary is available makes it really hard to do a whole bunch of other things. Like you can't do SRPT if you don't know how big the messages are. And by the way, applications know. I mean, the information's there. It's just not, not kept inside TCP. So, you know, you might say, well, why don't we fix the parts that are broken and keep the parts that are right? Uh, I have no problem with that, except, again, I don't know of any parts that are right with TCP. If you have ideas on that, I think I'd be curious to hear. So, as a result, I think we have to move to a different protocol that's basically different from TCP in every respect. If we want to fix this problem, get around the data center tax, allow software to really use the full performance potential of the network, I don't see any way to do that while keeping TCP. But I do think there's an answer to this, which is a protocol called HOMA that we developed at Stanford recently. And HOMA was developed as a clean slate design. We just started from scratch to think about if you were developing a protocol for the data center today, you know, what would that protocol look like? What would be the ideal structure of that protocol? And what's interesting is that it basically came up different from TCP on every one of those five axes. And I'd argue that these, these design elements actually work pr together pretty well to produce a really, really high performance data center protocol. And I'm going to go through it very quickly. I'm not going to go through it in detail. You can read the HOMA papers to find out the full details. Uh, but I will say HOMA is only for data centers. HOMA is not a solution for WANs. And so it's, it's only for use within data centers. OK, so let me just go through the five things again. So TCP is a byte stream based. HOMA is message based. So that means that the dispatchable units are recorded explicitly in the protocol and available when messages are received. And so this solves the load balancing problems. For example, several th threads can read from a single socket. And so the, the home protocol can pass full messages out to each thread. And if we get lucky in a future world to have NICs that can do dispatching for us, then we have NICs do dispatching directly to threads, which would be really fantastic. 
And then also, of course, the message lengths allow us to do SRPT, which we can't do in TCP. I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second. Second thing, TCP has connections. HOMA is connectionless. So in HOMA, the fundamental unit is not a connection. It's a remote procedure call. And that consists of a request message sent from a client to a server, and then a response message returned back from that server to the client. So the notion of round trip is explicit in the HOMA protocol. Every request has a response. RPCs are completely independent. So if you, if you launch a whole bunch of RPCs, there's no guarantee that they'll finish in the same order they're launched. In fact, in general, they won't, for, as you'll see in a second. HOMA has no long-lived connection state. So the only state it keeps around sort of application-specific state is for the RPCs that are currently active. Once an RPC completes, there's no additional state kept around. There is some long-lived state at HOMA, but it's peer-to-peer -peer state. So for every peer that a host communicates with, it has to keep some, a small amount of state for that peer. For example, about half of that is just the IP routing information right now, but it's about 200 bytes total state per peer. There's a little bit else that's used by the protocol to manage priorities and other kinds of things. One of the nice things about HOMA is there is no connection setup overhead. You just open a socket and start sending RPCs. And furthermore, a single socket can be used to issue any number of concurrent RPCs to any number of distinct destinations. So there's not a socket does not have a particular uh, peer in mind. Sockets, sockets can be used to communicate with multiple peers. And then finally, HOMA makes the remote procedure call the basis of its reliability, reliability model, so it ensures that the RPC completes or else you get an error back. There's no need to implement additional application level timers to keep track of, of timeouts. The third thing is that is congestion control. So TCP is sender based. HOMA is receiver driven for congestion control, which has major advantages. But first, let me describe the way flow control works in HOMA. If a sender wants to send a message to a particular receiver, it packetizes the message. And then the packets are in two groups. The first few packets are called unscheduled packets. The sender is entitled to transmit those without any sort of a, a prior agreement with the receiver. But after those first few packets, the remaining packets are called scheduled packets. They can only be transmitted in response to grants sent explicitly by the receiver. And the idea is to have enough unscheduled packets to cover the round trip time. So in an unloaded world, by the time the sender has sent the last <laughs> a scheduled, unscheduled packet, it can have received a grant for the first scheduled packet. And so it can, it can transmit at line rate in an unloaded world. So receivers use grants for a couple of purposes. They, can, they don't have to always send grants. They can withhold grants. And you can do that, use that for two purposes. First, if a receiver detects congestion at its top of rack switch, it can withhold grants to let that congestion subside. And then secondly, it can use the grants to prioritize among messages. So it can use, by, if it has several incoming messages, it will grant only to the highest priority message or, or messages. So grants are, are really useful for the, for the receiver. But, but the most important thing about this is the availability of message sizes. So message sizes allow us to predict the future. It's really great. You know, as soon as a receiver gets one packet for a message, it knows how many unscheduled packets are coming, and it knows the complete length of the message. And so if several, if there's an in-cast situation where several messages start arriving, the receiver instantly knows exactly how bad the situation is going to get. And so it can scale back very rapidly, just stop sending any grants, for example, until the congestion in the top of rec switch subsides a bit, so you don't have huge buffer buildup. So it's a much faster and more accurate response to congestion. TCP does not have that option because it doesn't have message sizes. So the only way TCP can infer connection is by watching past behavior and trying to infer from that and buffer buildup what's going to happen in the future. It has to make guesses. And so inevitably, this takes more time. And also, it's going to be less accurate because you'll, you'll guess wrong. Like, how do you guess when a message is going to, when a flow is going to end? There's, there's no way to do that. The only way you know is packets stop arriving and the buffers stop building up. So it's a much more accurate congestion signal. And the next thing is that in addition to using a, a grants to manage packets, HOMA also takes advantage of the priority queues that all modern switches have. You know, they typically have eight to 16 priority queues per egress port 
in a switch. And HOMA uses these for a couple of things. First, it uses them to implement SRPT. So when a receiver has multiple messages coming in, it will allow the uh, shorter messages to use higher priorities than the longer messages. That's the first thing. But if you combine this uh, with other features, it allows a much better trade-off between throughput and latency. So here's the problem. Buffers are funny. You know, you can't live with them, but you can't live without them either. So we actually need buffering. We want some buffer buildup in switches in order to maintain throughput. Because if otherwise, if, if you're just exactly sort of managing the throughput and no buffer buildup, and then one sender stops transmitting, then suddenly you have buffer underrun, you have no data to send on a link, and you waste bandwidth on the link. So you'd like to have a little bit of buffer buildup so that if one sender stops transmitting, the buffers that have built up will keep the link busy while you ramp up some other sender to start transmitting in, in replacement. So you want buffer buildup, but on the other hand, if you have buffer buildup, then it delays packets. Well, what happens at home it does, it uses a thing called overcommitment along with priorities. So a receiver at home will actually grant to multiple messages at the same time, not just one. And actually the goal is to build up some buffers. And so the low priority message messages will accumulate buffers in the low priority queue in the switch. But the higher priority messages will come in at higher priorities, and so they'll bypass all the buffering. So short messages never see any of the buffer buildup. And that way, if a sender stops sending for, for whatever reason, the receiver has time to detect that and send out more grants to other senders before the buffer's underrun and it's wasting link bandwidth. So the result of this is by the combination of using the priority queues and managing the grants and overcommitment is you can get high throughput by maintaining some buffering and also very low latency because the important messages don't have to wait in those queues. Whereas in TCP, where everything is in a single service class, you have this fundamental unpleasant choice to have, you have to make. Do I want to build up buffers to maintain throughput? Well, that's going to give me poor latency. Or do I want to try and drain the buffers, keep them really, really low, but then I'm going to have underruns and I'm going to waste throughput. So by using the priority queues, we can get the best of both worlds. Fourth, I mentioned that TCP uses fair scheduling as its, uh, as its policy to share bandwidth. HOMA uses pretty strict SRPT, shortest remaining processing time first, and does that again with a combination of sending grants and managing the priorities. And so I've, I've shown in this graph, now I've added a blue line for HOMA using this, the same benchmark that I showed earlier for TCP. And again, these are 99th percentile slowdowns running under fairly highly loaded network, 80% network load. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned, this is actually, this is running on Linux, by the way. This is a, a cluster of Linux machines. I'm running with the 25 gigabits per second network. So first thing you notice is that that blue line is a lot lower than those other lines. And notice that's a log scale. So it's more than an order of magnitude better than TCP, almost an order of magnitude better than DC TCP in terms of the short message slowdowns. And the second thing is, it's you might think that SRPT would make a trade-off where the short messages do better and the long messages do worse. Well, you can see a little bit of ramp up for the very longest messages in the blue curve, but even so, every single message size is faster under HOMA than under either DC, TCP, or TCP. And it's not close. Even at the largest messages, almost a factor of two difference in performance. Now, you might wonder, but can't you get starvation? If you have a really high traffic, aren't the longest messages, messages going to starve? Well, actually, it's really hard to reproduce this. I've tried to create scenarios where there is starvation. I can do it, but it's really, really hard to do. I had to, I had to actually uh, contort the benchmarks to not use their normal load distributions. And, but in any case, HOMA adds an extra feature, which is that it takes some small chunk of the receiver's bandwidth. You can, it's selectable, but typically 5 or 10% is about the right number. And it will use that bandwidth for the oldest message instead of the shortest message. So that guarantees that the long message, eventually they get, they get enough bandwidth that then their remaining size drops and then they, the priority system kicks in and runs them to completion. So with that combination, again, as far as I can tell, there is, there is no disadvantage to SRPT. It really is better for every single message length. And then finally, HOMA does not have any ordering requirements. 
So the packets can arrive in any order. The receivers will resort them. In practice, you know, they arrive almost perfectly in order anyhow. And so the the sort of the reordering is actually very efficient. It's not not a, a source of, of computational complexity. And I my belief is that with this mechanism, there will simply be no core congestion. So in comparison, if you compare HOMA to other algorithms that try and deal with core congestion, one of the criticism people say is HOMA doesn't deal with core congestion, which is true. But if you use HOMA, I don't think there will be any core congestion. And furthermore, this also allows us to do better load balancing across the CPU cores within the machine. Because again, the packets from different packets from the same message can take different trajectories and we can get better load balancing that way. So then the next question is, is it possible to replace TCP? Well, I mean, it's a pretty sobering proposition and it's kind of hard to imagine a more entrenched standard anywhere in high technology than to the TCP protocol. So uh, I, I undertake this with full realization that I may be out of my mind, but I decided the results with HOMA just have looked so good. Yeah, honestly, they, they've just exceeded my expectation at every step along the way. I decided it's, I've, I'm taking it as my own personal mission in life to do one of two things. Either figure out a way to, that HOMA can take over a significant fraction of TCP's traffic in the data center, or learn why this truly can't happen. So I'm going to keep going until I hit a, a roadblock that I simply can't solve. The first step along the way has been to create an implementation of HOMA that people can actually use. And we started off with simulations and an implementation in the, the RAM cloud storage system, neither one of which is very practical. So. Uh, as Jamal mentioned, uh, one of the things that makes me maybe a little bit of a freak among academics is I love to code. I, mean, I really, coding is one of the things that makes life worth living to me. If I don't write five or 10,000 lines of code a year, I feel, I feel like I let myself down. And so a couple of years ago, I decided I'll, I'll, I'll take this on as a personal programming project to build a Linux kernel driver. Knew nothing about the Linux kernel. I, my knowledge is probably still well, compared to any of you here, it's probably still vanishingly small. But so over the last few years, I've I've done that, and we now have an implementation of HOMA that runs in Linux. I'm not going to go through all the stuff on this slide, but it's a, it's a kernel module you can load. Um, runs on a couple of versions of Linux. In terms of quality, the goal was the goal was not to make a research prototype. I don't actually like that term. I think that to me is I feel like a dirty word. It's, research prototype means something that doesn't actually work. But you can somehow write a paper about it and make claims about it, even though it doesn't actually really work. So I think the quality is nearing production quality. I think it's at the point now where the only way to fix the next bugs is going to be people who are really trying to use it in production. So there are probably still bugs out there. In terms of performance, it completely dominates both TCP and DCTCP. So all workloads, all message sizes, just a couple of examples for short messages at the median and the, we have five standard benchmarks we run. At the median, it's about three to maybe six times faster than TCP. And out of the tail, 99th percentile latency is anywhere from about an order of magnitude to almost two orders of magnitude faster than TCP. So it's a huge difference. And in fact, the, the tail latency for HOMA, 99th percentile, is almost always better than the median latency for either TCP or DCTCP. If you want to see more details, there's a paper about this in ATC last year that has lots more measurements. So how do we replace TCP, though? So the biggest problem I see is that HOMA is not API compatible. You know, at various points, I thought, is there any way to slide it in under the existing TCP sockets interface? And there's, I, I have not been able to figure out a way that makes sense because again, we need that message information. So it's fundamentally different. And realistically, you know, there's, I said thousands of applications here that layer on sockets. There's probably tens of thousands or hundreds. Of, there's, there's so many applications out there. There's no way we're gonna convert the vast majority of those applications that are layered on the TCP sockets interface. That's just not, not gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, but on the other hand, it's not clear uh, that we actually have to fix those applications because in many cases, those applications need to work over the wide area network as well as local area networks. And so HOMA doesn't work over the WAN, but also many of them don't really need the performance that HOMA provides. You know, many traditional applications, SSH probably doesn't need HOMA level performance, for example. So instead, 
we should think about what are the applications that really will benefit from HOMA. These are the newer data center applications. And what's interesting about them is that by and large, they do not layer directly on the sockets interface. They use one of a few RPC frameworks. And there aren't, as far as I know, there aren't very many widely used RPC frameworks. There's gRPC and Thrift and probably a couple of others out there, but it can't be more than a handful of frameworks that virtually all applications out there use. So I think the solution to this is to integrate HOMA with the major frameworks. And then once that's done, then it's a trivial change for any given application. It's sort of, sort of equivalent to specifying a different server name for your application. Just say use HOMA instead of, of TCP. So uh, the next step after building the Linux kernel implementation, I started building support for HOMA into gRPC. This is still a work in progress, but there's an open source repo out there on GitHub for this as well. A C++ integration works pretty well right now. Uh, although it doesn't support the security stuff yet. It's without encryption. And Java integration is just, that's underway. It's sort of embryonic, not ready yet. So I take a brief digression to talk about gRPC. So gRPC, it's been very sad working with gRPC because it's just very, 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 very slow. <laughs> it's, uh, I have to say, it's, it's unimaginably slow. I can't, in my mind, rationalize how TCP or how gRPC could be as slow as it is. You know, this table shows round trip times for short messages. And the, the left column, the network column shows kind of from when you make a kernel call on one end to when things pop out a kernel call on the other end. So it's the network and the kernel stacks. You know, so that's 20 or 30 microseconds. But then there's 30 microseconds on each end just in the gRPC layer. Just so the total round trip times are 90 microseconds. You know, if our goal is we want to get five microsecond round trips, it's pretty clear that it can't be done with gRPC. Uh, now, HOMA, for some reason, makes gRPC faster. I don't completely understand that. It seems like it should be doing about the same amount of work in the gRPC layer as TCP is, but, but it's actually about twice as fast. But it's still just very sadly slow, unfortunately. So. In the end, I think if we want to get, you know, if we want to make that network performance available to applications, we're going to have to develop a new super lightweight RPC framework. And I don't see any reason why that can't be done. I'd, I think maybe gRPC was developed in a world where they were thinking mostly WAN, maybe. And it's super highly layered. The, the number of method calls it takes to get from an application calling in until a packet goes out on the wire is it's such a big number, you don't even want to know about it. It'll just, it'll just make you sad. <laughs> So I hope there's nobody that's a developer of gRPC in here. So sorry about that. But anyhow, that's been very disappointing. Okay, so this brings me to the, uh, to the I call it part two, but it's really the last step of the part of the talk. Which is, so eliminating TCP makes a big difference. It's a, it's a huge difference, but we can do even better. We're still, even with HOMA, we're still almost an order of magnitude off what the network hardware can provide. And it's not that there's remaining problems at HOMA. For example, HOMA's pretty much completely eliminated congestion. It's, it's the technology in which HOMA is currently implemented, that doing it in software. And this is an unavoidable problem in that network speeds are increasing at this amazing rate. CPU speeds aren't changing much. They haven't changed in the last decade, almost two decades now. And so fundamentally, it's just harder and harder for software to keep up. It's just, it's just I, I don't, there's no solution to that problem, except that it means we really can't implement transport protocols and software. You know, for HOMA today, there's about a little less than 10 microseconds of software overhead in the Linux kernel to do a round trip in HOMA. So again, if we want to do five microsecond round trips, that's, that number doesn't commute, compute. Now, some people will say, and I'll talk a little bit about, well, it's just those terrible operating systems. If you just move everything to user space, then suddenly the world is wonderful and everything will be fast. Uh, I'm going to argue that's, that helps a bit, but not enough. And so ultimately, we're going to have to move transport protocols out of software. That's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen right away. But I think it's something that as a community, we need to start working towards. So let me just walk through this. First, uh, let me talk about a little bit of my experiences with HOMA in the Linux kernel. So first, let's talk about latency. The, the best case round trip times for short messages in Linux right now with HOMA are about 15 microseconds. As I mentioned, about 10 microseconds of software time and five microseconds in the, in the networking hardware. If you look at the 99th percentile latency, 
it's more like 100 microseconds, so seven times the best case time. And that's really high. In comparison, I, I mentioned we also implemented home in the RAM cloud storage system, which is a, a user space implementation that uses kernel bypass, and it gets 14 microsecond tail latency. So clearly we can do way better than this. What's the problem? Well, it turns out the problem is entirely software overheads. And furthermore, those overheads come almost entirely from load balancing. It's, it's just really, really hard, I think, to do load balancing in a way that doesn't give up a tremendous amount of performance. Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier, you know, a single core can't handle more than about 10 gigabits per second. Once you do load balancing, there's going to be two problems. First, there's a fundamental loss in efficiency I'm going to talk about from load balancing. As soon as you split across multiple cores, there's a big factor in performance that happens immediately. And then on top of that, there are hotspots. So let's go over the, the two factors. This graph shows the, uh, it's a CDF of latency, small message round trip, measured under two different conditions. So, so first the x-axis shows the round trip time, and then the y value shows the fraction of messages that completed in that time or less. So for example, uh, let's see if, well, I can't point, Never mind. Let's see, well, let me see if I can. Yeah, so take this point, that point says that on the blue curve, 20% of the messages finished in less than 40 microseconds. Let's take the green curve first. The green, that's the ideal best case. Running on the low load, single client thread, a single server. And it turns out all of the protocol processing is done on a single server core for that. And that gives 15, roughly 15 microseconds latency, and the tail latency is not too much worse. The blue curve, that's reality. So the green curve is it's just not reality, unfortunately. This is running at high load where there's load balancing occurring. And notice what happens is the median latency is three times higher. It's not just the tail. The median is three times higher. In fact, even at very low percentiles, down in there, it's dramatically higher. This was surprising to me. So I went in and I started measuring where is all the time going? What, what's going wrong? I thought, is there some culprit, some one thing that's suddenly taking a lot more time? There's no culprit. I looked at every phase, divided the, the RPC transmission and stuff up into about a dozen phases on client and server. Every phase ran about three times slower, two to three times slower. I, I haven't actually measured this, but my, my hypothesis is that this is cache interference. As soon as you split across multiple cores, suddenly you're getting a whole bunch of cache coherency traffic and the performance drops a lot. Now you may think, maybe I just did a bad job implementing HOMA. Uh, maybe there's ways to get around it, but there are other examples out there. Google has a system called Snap Pony. It's actually a user space implementation where they do load balancing across cores. And uh, they didn't draw the conclusion that I'm about to present to you, but when I read through the paper, it turns out they did the same experiment in multiple ways. First, they did experiment with no load balancing, one core handling all network traffic. And one core could handle 70 gigabits per second, unidirectional, traffic with very large packets with one core. When they went to load balancing with somewhere between four and a half and seven cores, depending on they have two different load balancing mechanisms, they get 80 gigabits per second. So it's a, for them, it's a four to six X efficiency loss from load balancing. It's, it's just a tremendous difference. So by the way, a rule of thumb is if you would get to a point where one core isn't enough, two cores isn't going to be enough either or three cores. You'll have to go to four cores before you actually get any performance improvement over one core. It's just from load balancing and caching costs. And then the other problem is that load balancing makes things even worse. Even worse. So with HOMA, I had more flexibility than with TCP, and I actually spent a lot of time tuning trying to eliminate hotspots, but I, I was not able to completely eliminate them. So as I said before, it, Information passes through three cores on its way from the network to an application. And the driver reads packets from the interface and batches them up into groups, pass that off to a different core where the IP and HOMA stack runs. And then eventually the data finds its way to an application core. So in this example, we've got a long message being received and passed through one trajectory to get to an application core. Now suppose a short message starts arriving and suppose we're lucky in that it goes to a different driver core 
and a different stack core, but sadly, its application happens to be sharing the same core that's handling the IP and HOMA stacks for the long message. Unfortunately, that creates a hotspot and priority goes to the stack processing for the, uh, for the messages, that long message. And when there are big batches, which there can be, that can result in delays of 100 microseconds or more, where the application does not get a chance to run because that core is just pegged down inside the soft IRQ layer processing packets. That is, this is the fundamental source of, uh, of tail latency for Homer right now. And unfortunately, I have not been able to figure out how to get rid of this one. Now, the problem is that there's three different schedulers all operating independently in Linux. First, there's the NIC, which is scheduling packets to cores using RSS, for example. And then there's various mechanisms used internally in Linux to pick which soft IRQ core to use for a packet. I was actually able to hijack and pervert that mechanism in ways that I'm sure nobody in Linux ever intended in order to be able to get around to better load balancing there. But then there's this third scheduler, which is the thread schedule, which has its own very complex set of rules and is choosing where to put the threads. And this, this, I have no control over that. And so there's just no way to avoid occasionally having the hotspot that you see on this, on this graph or on this figure. So then you might think, well, the answer is just move transports to user space. It's just uh, operating systems have so many things to do. There's so much complexity. There's just no way to do an efficient protocol implementation there. So move to user space. And you know, if you look at some of the data from the papers, you might conclude this is a good idea. So I've just, I've just included a few samples here. So for example, small message, median round trip times, HOMA in the kernel is about 15 microseconds. HOMA in RAM cloud, which is user space using RDMA is about five microseconds. The ERPC project at Carnegie Mellon, which also uses user space, about four microsecond round trips. So 3x improvements there. Tail latency, I mentioned earlier, HOMA in the kernel is 100 microseconds. HOMA in RAM cloud is seven times faster, 14 microseconds. And then small message throughput, how many messages per core can you pump through a system? HOMA in the kernel is only about 0.1 million, 100,000 messages per, per core used. HOMA in RAM cloud is 10 times that. And then if you look at ERPC, it's about 25 times that. So this all says maybe we can do a lot better at user space. But all of those user space implementations are basically research prototypes, and they're just way oversimplified. They don't do a lot of stuff that any production system would have to do. So they're measured under the most perfect conditions. Typically they have no load balancing at all, or if they do, it's carefully hand partitioned. So there's perfect partitioning and no sharing of information and no cache misses. So it's, it's just the best possible you can imagine. Typically they only consider short messages. Well, that's easy. You know, the problem is juggling the long messages and the short messages. The long things tend to interfere with the short things. They didn't have any long things. So of course there's no interference there. They don't do congestion control by and large. And they're typically using protocols where there is no shared state. Again, so, so it partitions perfectly among the various cores that they're using. But we do have one example of a user space protocol that does address all those factors. It's, it's uh, HOMA's, uh, uh, sorry, it's Google's Snap system. And I believe, I don't know if it is still used in production, but I believe it has been used in production at Google. If there's anybody from Google here, they can confirm that. So it's a production quality implementation that addresses all of these things. So let's compare Snap to HOMA in Linux. Well, Snap is better. You know, like best case latency, Snap is nine microseconds versus 15 microseconds for HOMA. And then if you compute how many cores it takes to drive a 100 gig network at 80% in both directions. So 80 gigs in, in and 80 gigs out at the same time. HOMA takes 17 cores to drive that. It's just a, it's a scary high number, but, uh, but Snap is nine to 14 cores. So it's less, but it's, it's less than a factor of two better. It's not an order of magnitude better. And so I conclude from this that maybe we can do a little bit better with user space, but this doesn't feel to me like it's still the solution we really want. So the only other option is we have to move the transport out of software. Instead, move it into the NIC hardware. And I think the ideal world would be one where the transport runs, in fact, basically the whole protocol stack up through transport layer has to run in the NIC. And then applications access the NIC using kernel bypass. So there's no operating system involved in, in handling messages coming in and out. 
And the interface is entirely based on messages. That is, the notion of a packet never gets to, the, to software. The, the notion of a packet is entirely encapsulated at the NIC layer. And while doing this, but we should probably do a bunch of other things in the NIC as well. So for example, the NIC should handle dispatching and load balancing. So if you have a service that has many threads, the NIC should be able to pick idle threads to dispatch incoming messages to, and it should be able to do that very efficiently. Uh, we need other features besides just performance. You know, you need virtualization and management features for you know, handling virtual, uh, virtual machines, doing things like rate limiting, that should all be in the NIC, and probably encryption authentication should be in the NIC as well. Then the question is, how do you get there? So this is a really tough NIC architecture. This is not going to be easy to do this. It means we need something that can process packets at line rate, first thing, but it needs to be programmable to support all these features. How do you do that? And I really believe that uh, it would be a very bad thing if we ended up with a NIC implementation that was proprietary and closed. I think that would just be a terrible thing. So we need a NIC architecture that supports enough programmability that the protocol implementations can still be open source and managed by a community and we have visibility into them. Unfortunately, I don't think any of today's NIC architectures meets the need for this. So one approach is based on having so many core designs. Take an existing NIC and just add a whole bunch of general purpose cores to the NIC. Well, that doesn't really solve the problem. That may offload the main cores, but you're still doing the transport in software. So it's gonna have all of the problems with the software transport. And by the way, those CPUs are generally slower than your main CPU. So it's gonna do everything, it's gonna have all worse overhead problems than the main CPUs. Another alternative that many people are proposing is to use FPGAs. Maybe that could work. I worry that the design environment for FPGAs is just so challenging. It's too complex an environment to work in. And again, I'm worried that the implementations will end up becoming proprietary. They won't be, they won't be suitably programmable. There's a third option, which has become popular in switches, which is these P4 pipelines. These are these match action rules that are stacked together in pipelines that, that are starting to get used in network switches that can process packets at line rate and have some degree of programmability. That actually looks pretty attractive, except that they don't have a mechanism for keeping long-term state, that is, or, or medium-term state. You need to keep some sort of state about a message and to do message reassembly and things like that. And P4 right now does not keep enough state to do that. So we need a new architecture. I think it's a, a really interesting challenge. You know, the computer architecture community talks about how because uh, our general purpose cores are not improving in speed, we need to start developing new kinds of special purpose architectures. This is a really great problem for them to address. And so I, I, I think for people that are computer architects, I think it's a really interesting problem here to come up with a, a great new architecture. I don't have the answer here. I don't think this is going to be easy to do, but um, it's a really int intriguing problem. Let's see, I've been talking a while, so I think I'm, uh, you might be wondering, why don't we just use InfiniBand for this? I'm not going to go over this slide in detail. InfiniBand got a lot of basics right in terms of kernel bypass and, and had really, really fast NICs. Mellanox NICs are amazing, amazingly fast. But the abstractions are implementing are wrong. I can talk more about that during Q&A if you want. So just a couple of other slides I want to mention. HOMA is not without its controversies. You know, there have been several recent papers that have claimed to find problems with HOMA. For example, that HOMA uses too much buffer space. It's not not sustainable on modern switches. Or proposing alternatives that people claim are better than HOMA. There's a few examples listed on this slide. Uh, I've read these papers and I, I actually argue that all of these papers have pretty significant flaws in them, unfortunately. Uh, one problem is that they, in some cases, they simply restrict HOMA. You can make HOMA fail if you restrict it in various unrealistic ways, like using statically allocated buffers that are really small. You can make HOMA behave badly. Or in other cases, using comparing against versions of HOMA that aren't, aren't actually real HOMA, they're hobbled in some way. So I don't want to get into a food fight over this, but, but if, you are, if you have seen a paper that, that criticizes HOMA and proposes something better, I would suggest just jump over to the HOMA wiki I've created here, where I have more detailed responses about the papers I know about, trying to at least present what the other side of this argument is. I suggest you read that and then you can make up your mind whether you think these other systems are better than HOMA. And by the way, if you see a system that claims to be better than HOMA and isn't on the wiki, let me know. I'd love to hear about it and go take a look at it. So I'm actually very interested in having an open discussion about this. Happy to, to talk about this. And uh, my view is, you know, the best protocol should win. But right now, based on what I've seen, I think HOMA is actually still better than any of the alternatives that have been published recently. And then finally, before I close, I guess maybe the bigger meta question, does this really matter? 
You know, do applications actually care about harnessing the full network performance? Maybe we don't need to give them the full potential of the network. And today we're, kind of, we're stuck in what I would call a no chicken, no egg cycle. So people ask, well, what applications need this level of performance? And I honestly, I can't answer that question because there are no applications today that absolutely must have this level of performance because no one would bother writing those applications. They can't, there's no system that would support them. So by and large, today's applications, they manage to make do with the performance that is provided by today's networks and stacks. But given that world, that means also there's not much incentive for the people building the underlying infrastructure to make it better because there's no application screaming out for it. So we're kind of stuck in this cycle right now. And I think the interesting question is, if we make the networking as blindingly fast as I think we can do, will that suddenly enable new applications that people just didn't even bother thinking about building today because it was hopeless? And I think that's, that's the interesting question. And if you hear of applications that where the application really would benefit dramatically from Import performance improvements like this in the network, I'd love to hear about it because that's, I mean, that's the ultimate question. The good news is that as an academic, I don't actually need to have a market in order to work on something. So it's, it's in research, we can go off and build things even though we don't know that there's applications that need them. And then hopefully by building them, we'll enable applications and they'll come along later. You know, this would be a terrible way to do a startup. <laughs> All right, so just to, to conclude, hardware people have given us a gift, really, Again, data center network and hardware is fabulous, really, really great. The question is we want to make that performance available to applications. And if we do, we're going to have to make some pretty major changes in how we do things, it's starting with a new transport protocol. And then we'll need other things too, like better RPC frameworks and probably eventually moving the transport layer to the NIC. So those are what we have to do. I, Clearly, I'm a HOMA advocate today. I believe that HOMA is the best candidate for this, but I'd be delighted to discuss alternatives and hear your complaints and criticisms and, and, and suggestions for alternatives. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. Wow. That, that was amazing. That was an amazing keynote. Another, let's give him a, one more round, please. Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll ask the first question, if you don't mind. You showed, uh, I think one of the slides you had, Shenango. Any family relationship to the authors? Uh, if you see an author, who, if you see an author whose last name is Osterhout, we're probably related. This, it's not a coincidence. But <laughs> I have, actually, I have two daughters, both of whom are CS PhDs. So. Right, right. She was so the one who presented. I, I, she presented at, at, at the conference in 2019. Ah, okay. Yeah. So that's why I was wondering. And, and, and we have the DC pen paper later, so you can stand around and have a right, conversation right. maybe. You know, I was sitting in a conference one time listening to a talk. And you know how people often, they'll reference other papers by having author name and the conference and the year. And there was this reference was oh something at a con SOSP 2017. I was looking at this thing. I don't, who could that be? I didn't have a paper in that conference. And then I realized, oh, it's my daughter. <laughs> so any, uh, uh, how does Thanksgiving discussion go? <laughs> well, my wife is also a computer scientist. Oh, God. All right. So All right. we have dinner table conversations a little bit different from most families. <laughs> okay. All right, we'll open it up to questions. And should you do your remote? And I know you have tons of questions, but. Yeah, I was going to say we will be a little time limited, so. Yeah, um... well, we can move. The break is going to be extended a little bit. It's going to be. I assume since we started late, I'd be able to. Yes. A little bit later. Yes. Okay. We'll we open have, it up. Anybody? We'll have the first one right here. Uh, my name is Lawrence Brackman from Meta. So I have uh, some comments and some questions. Uh, you mentioned no, no more than ten G per core, and I think that very dep uh, depends a lot on the size of the messages. It's easy to get more than twenty two G in one core, uh, you know, for streaming or large RPC messages. Uh, because of TSO and GSO, right, in TCP. Uh, I have a question. In your results and in your graphs, are you interleaving large and small RPCs? The results of, so the question is, in the results of the graphs, are we interleaving large and small RPCs? Yes. Yeah, so those graphs were, there was a workload that had a mixture of a whole bunch of messages of different sizes, from okay. very small to very large. Because a, a typical solution is to have smaller RPCs and their own flows, and then you will not have the head of line blocking you know, uh, fair queue and we'll actually help you to finish faster, right, uh, in those cases. Sorry, say that again? Uh, if you have 
smaller RPCs on their own flows in TCP, for example, it would allow them to complete a lot faster and you would not have the same head of line blocking as when you're interleaving very large messages with small messages in the same flow. Uh, that's right. You're thinking of having, have open, having different uh, connections open for messages of different sizes to eliminate well, head of line blocking? Primarily, you know, like you, you have probably two flows, one for, you know, less than 10K or something like that, and then the other one for distributing flows. Um, the other question is like, you, you, you focus on DC, but you also are talking a lot about the case where you only have one flow and that you cannot, you know, in TCP, you cannot use uh, all of the paths in, in the network, right? So that seems to me to be a, a conflict. Right? Typically, DCs will have many, many flows. And the fact that, you know, one flow cannot interleave its packets through different paths does not, is not a big issue, right? Even though, uh, to some degree, you can do it in TCP because TCP is a lot more robust to reordering than it was in the past, right? In the past, small reordering would, three, would in, be interpreted as a loss. Uh, nowadays, that's, you know, most of the time it's not the case. You can have large reordering without triggering, triggering a retransmit. Yes, well. TCP can now tolerate reordering. The, the receiver yes. will reassemble mm -hmm. small losses as if it was. So, so in, in Linux, it is dynamic. It looks at the history of reordering to determine when reordering will, should trigger a retransmit, right? And in the newer versions, they also use time in conjunction, right? So that even if there's a lot of reordering, but they arrive close enough in time, right, right. they will not trigger retransmit. Yeah, so that, I mean, that sounds great. Of course, if that happens, then we should just turn on packet spraying on our data centers, and I think core congestion will go away for TCP as well. I, although a lot of the congestion happens on the receive link, I, I think at the last link, from the top of rack to the, to the host, I think that's where most of the congestion happens. Anyway, so the interleaving, you know, may not be able to solve that problem. And that's comment I wanted to make is that, you know, when you mention RSS and the issue about the same core ha handling different things, right? Uh, you, you had a slide. Uh, you can also use a uh, receive flow steering to ensure that uh, the packet coming in or the message is stays on the same core where the application will be. Okay. Right. Uh, Lawrence. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm going to, because we don't have much time left, but you can, John, is, you're going to be here until Thursday. I'm, so I'm going to be here today and tomorrow. So, yeah. Until tomorrow, right? So yeah, I'd be happy can, to chat more and break yeah. with you. But I don't know if you know each other. That's Mr. TCP Vegas. Am I correct, Lawrence? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to find you. Right. <laughs> All right. I've tried lots of different things in Linux, including a little bit of the, we can talk more about the receive flow steering, see whether that would help more. Uh, John, you, you talked about the receiver uh, controlling the flow rate stuff, and you then also said top of rack switches. So should I infer from that that this is not an end-to-end -end thing between the end host, but there are devices in the middle that are also contributing to flow control? No, no, it's purely end-to-end. -end. So the receiver, for example, is inferring the is referring the likelihood of queue buildup in the top of rec switch. And then if I know I see if I know I have three messages arriving from three different senders, then it's virtually inevitable that I'm going to get queue buildup in the top of rec switch. And so it infers that, but it doesn't it doesn't actually have doesn't even need direct measurements of the top of rec switch. Okay. So and and so I'm trying to infer from which of those which of those top of rack switches if I'm if on a across the network from two different producers and receivers, then they'll be paying attention to essentially everything, but you sort of tend to know where it's coming on the fan end. That's where you're assuming the, the congestion will be. Yeah, the assumption is the congestion is going to be at the receiver's top of rec switch. It's right. not going to be at any of the other switches. Right. Yeah, okay. And again, this, is, this gets back to the core congestion versus edge congestion. But edge congestion is always at the receiver, so that's why it makes sense to do the congestion control from there, because that's where you have the most information. Okay, anybody? We'll, we'll take maybe two more questions, and then... So there's one on, let's just let's, make it quick though. Let's let's interleave one from the from the audience audience uh, from the from remote the bridge. Right. Um, question from Jacob Keller. One challenge I see in moving protocol to the NIC is how to avoid the situation where we end up being an, unable to change it in the future. Are we assuming that programmability in the hardware is enough? I think that was addressed, but yeah, no, that's that's definitely a challenge in that putting things in hardware tends to make them more rigid and harder to change. And so it's pretty clear that network 
protocols are pretty fluid. You know, we need to be able to continue to evolve them and, and add features. And so we're going to have to find, that's why the NIC has to be reasonably programmable. You know, what would be great would be if, if there's sort of a standard NIC architecture that emerges in the same way that we have standard CPU architectures. And so there could be lots of vendors building these NICs, but they're using the same programming mechanism. And so we could effectively write the programs that are, are portable across NICs. That's, uh, you know, that's, that's maybe a dream, not a reality, but that would be a great goal, I think. We'll do one last. So on, on the, uh, the, the topic of the hardware actually running the, the protocols, one of the things that you had mentioned a couple times that I, I was trying to wrap, wrap my head around is for having the NIC hardware, if you were running Home SA in the NIC and having it dispatched to dispatcher threads on the host, what sort of, that seems like a very uh, kind of hand wavy, how do I hand off something directly to a CPU core from the NIC directly in the hardware? Um, do, do you have any thoughts that you can expand on? Like, is that part of the protocol that you're assuming that that might be there? Or is that something of the programmability of the NIC? So the dispatch, me the dispatch mechanism, I would assume would not be part of the HOMA protocol per se, but would be part of the NIC API. And, and we're able to do that with the with the RDMA NICs right now, where it can hand off directly to to threads. And so I, I I don't anticipate any problem with it. It can be as simple as you know some sort of memory interface where the NIC drops a packet in memory and sets a bit, and the application is polling the bit, for example, to wait for a packet to come in. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so I have a. Uh... Yes, yeah, so I had a comment on what Jake said. So Jake and I work together. Um, he probably is not aware, but we are working on all the three bullets that you have listed down there uh, at Intel. So I, I would really like to talk about more about the, uh, the P4 comment that you made about not having long-term state and understand better what is uh, the missing piece. Uh, absolutely, you know, the transport layer that we are putting in has to be programmable there, cannot be on cores course replacing course doesn't work. Um, so, um, you know, we do have some stuff that, you know, I would like to discuss and get ideas on. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to talk more. Okay, maybe one last short question. If nobody's there, I know Shrijit has a thousand questions <laughs> or comments. Right? Yeah, I, I probably have more comments. Okay. Uh, could those be done after? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I actually, I wanted. To, I was going to say I want to uh, reassert what Lauren said. Right. I think connection muxing in TCP and and steering can address many of the issues that I think you were talking about. Because even you can add to connection muxing priority management and steering in a meaningful way. And the one downside of doing receiver driven is that the ECMP load balancing assumptions or assertions that you can make from the receiver is going to be a little bit weaker, right? Because the fabric could be changing its paths and direction. Then you're going to make a, a, a backward prediction based on history as opposed to what you would see if you were going in the forward path. But have it, that said, I think I would love to spend some time talking about the new architecture concepts that you were talking about, because I think uh, there are ways in which we can address all of the concerns you're talking about without having to completely rip and replace the current designs, but that could be a long. You're yeah, just discussion. responding about the the backward issue. So the receiver part only works for managing the congestion at the at the receiver's exactly. top of rack switch. Yeah. You're right. It does not. It's not useful for managing congestion in the core. Yeah. If you have to do that, you need some other mechanism. But, has to so yeah. this is based on the assumption that with a protocol like Homa, you don't need to manage in the core. That problem goes away. Yeah. Because of the distribution. If that problem doesn't really go away, then then there's clearly more work to do. Yeah. Sure. All right. Let, let's call that a wrap. 13-minute break. We're back for the next session. Let's give a, another hand of applause to...